A question that every single person needs to wrestle with at one point in their life, whether they realize it or not, is who is Jesus to you? Now, I don't like to ask questions in that way, especially when it comes to the Bible, but asking the question of who is Jesus to you impacts how you will live your life. If you believe Jesus to be one way, then that will impact every single component of how you live your life. And so it is vital for us to look into the pages of Scripture to see how does Scripture describe Jesus? Who is he and what is it that he has done? If we don't have a proper understanding of who Jesus is, if we don't have a proper understanding of what Scripture says Jesus is, then we're going to be living a life missing out on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as we examine our text this morning, before John begins to dive into his letter to specifically the churches, what we're going to see is in his commissioning, Jesus reveals himself as he is. Jesus reveals himself not only in his appearance, but in his speech of who he is, demonstrating that as we continue to go through these first few chapters of Revelation, Jesus has the authority to speak to the churches in a way that calls them to repentance, in a way that he can praise them for their good works. And so as we study the scriptures this morning, I invite you to open up to Revelation chapter 1. We'll be studying verses 12 through 20, but we will read 9 through 20 because that is the greater context in which we will find our passage. And as we unpack this morning, there's really two primary things I want us to see. The first is how Jesus has revealed himself to his church, and second, I want us to see that Jesus is in the midst of his church and what that means then for us today. So if you are able, I invite you to please stand for the reading of the word of our Lord this morning. What we have before us is the inerrant and the infallible word of God, and that everything contained within these pages is good and profitable for all things pertaining to life and godliness. As I close, I will declare that this is the word of the Lord, and if you agree, I invite you to respond with thanks be to God. Revelation, beginning in chapter 1, verse 9, says this, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the golden of, in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the shining was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And as, the, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, use me this morning as your instrument. May your word go out. May it fall upon the ears of those that are listening. May they have ears to hear. May you speak clearly and may anything that come from me, Lord, be silenced and fall on deaf ears. Lord, strengthen me this morning. Strengthen this congregation this morning. May we see Jesus for who he is and may we take courage and strength in that. And if there are those this morning who are not found in Christ and they see maybe for the first time who truly Jesus is, may they repent and turn to you. We love you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. First thing that I want us to spend our time doing this morning is unpacking the revealed Jesus. Because as we have seen throughout this first portion of chapter 1, is that as John is writing, he sees this vision of Jesus. And as he sees this vision of Jesus, he is then commissioned to write what he sees. 
and he's writing to the seven churches. And as he writes to the seven churches in Asia Minor, we'll go into more of those churches in more detail later. What we are seeing is that John is being commissioned as a prophet to send to the churches things of praise and calling them to repent and turn away from their actions. And God is the only one that can call anyone to repent. God is the only one that can have the authority to bestow this kind of encouragement or this kind of calls for repentance. And so what we are seeing before us this morning is what a picture of what Daniel may have seen in Daniel 7 and Daniel 10. When he stands and he has these visions and the connection here between Jesus in this passage and in Daniel is no accident. Because we, what we are seeing is the revealed and glorified Son of Man, the Son of God. God in the flesh, standing before John, giving him instructions. And what we see in this description of his golden sash and his robes and so on and so forth, we're going to look at each one, but I want us to understand that each of these descriptions is to be taken as a whole. They describe Jesus. We can look at them and look at their meaning, but they're not to be taken in isolation. They shouldn't be individual things that we can just pull off and look at and leave them isolated from the rest. This is a picture of Jesus, and we should take it as such. And so, we will be examining first verses 13 through 18. We see this picture of Jesus as a righteous judge, as a high priest, and a sovereign ruler. And this description will give one of two responses if you are found, uh, one of two responses to anyone listening and seeing. If you are found in Christ, this picture is an encouragement to you. Because our king has authority and power. We will also see that if you are outside of Christ, this picture should terrify you. Because this is the same king that, while he bestows mercy upon those who call upon his name, for those that don't, this is the same one who will stand as their judge. So let's look at what we see first. The long robe that Christ has and the golden sash. This is a callback to Exodus and the priests that were established by Moses. The priests had very similar looking garments, the long robe and the sash that they wore. And so Jesus here is being shown to us as our great high priest, as our mediator, as the one that stands between us and God. There is no longer a need to go to any kind of man or institution that they would go to God on our behalf. That bridge has been made. We are made righteous before God through Christ. We have him. There's no need to go to anyone else to say, well, you're, you're more holy than I am. You're cleaner than I am. You go to God on my behalf. That's not to say that we shouldn't pray for each other and lift each other up in prayer because that is vital for the life of the church. But because of Jesus, because of his priestly sacrifice and what he has done for us, we can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. And without fear. We see that he has white hair like snow or like wool. This is an allusion to the ancient, the ancient of days in Daniel 7. We see that in the ancient of days in Daniel 7 is clearly a picture of God. And so when we have this same description given to Jesus, there's that clear to, uh, connection that Jesus is God. He is not a lesser God. He is not a middle ground. He's not some kind of lower God. Jesus is God. He is also man. He is God incarnate. He perfectly fulfills God's will. He is not just a man that has good teachings. He is God among us. He is God with us. If Jesus is only a man, then he is not able to live up to God's perfect standards, to God's perfect law. Therefore, his sacrifice on the cross is not a sacrifice. It's just a death, and it means nothing. But if he's God... And he cannot substitute for us. He cannot take our place on the cross. He has to be both. He needs to be both God and man. And so we cannot minimize this importance of who Jesus is. Yes, he sympathizes with us, but also remember, he is God. And he has saved us from our sins. It says that he has eyes like flames of fire. This one hurt me. Because these are the eyes that see into your soul. These are the eyes that see and examine every thought and word and action and intention. It's the eyes that look into the darkness and light up every single deed that was hidden. And so when he looks upon us, those piercing eyes, the question is, what does he see? 
Does he see our own self-righteous deeds? Does he see our sin or arrogance? Or does he see a dead heart? Or does he see the righteousness, the righteousness of Christ staring back at us? Because if you are found in Christ, it's the righteousness of Jesus that is seen. Because the Holy Spirit has given us life. Because we have put our faith and trust in him. Our God sees everything. We think about the prophet Jonah who tried to hide and run from God. And it's easy for us to sit here and go, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. Why would you do that? But I think a lot of us try to do that because when we do sinful things, we do it in the dark so no one will see it. Jonah tried to run from God, but God saw him. God saw every step that he took. God sent a large fish that swallowed Jonah and brought him back to where he needed to go. And so though there are many within the church who might be able to deceive their neighbor about how they look on the outside, there might be many who have given false professions of faith or have false actions to show that maybe they are a Christian or maybe their words show that they're Christians, but the reality is is that for some, the Lord knows the truth. You might be able to deceive your, you might be able to deceive your neighbor, but the Lord is not fooled. The Lord sees. And with his eyes like flames of fire, he sees through everything. And so if there is sin that you're hiding, repent of that sin. Confess it to the Lord. Bring it before him. And if you're not found in Christ, believe in him. So that he might not look upon you and see your dead works and your dead heart, but instead he sees a new heart and a new birth and the righteousness of Christ. Moving on, it says he has feet like burnished bronze. Bronze that is refined in a furnace that shines brightly. This is both the righteousness of Jesus standing upon the perfect obedience to the law, but it is, all, but it is also his trampling of the wicked. That those would, who would rebel against him, who have refused his gospel, have said, I've seen you, Lord, but I don't want you. They will not be able to stand before the king of kings. It says he has the voice like a roar of many waters. Verse 10 has already told us that he has the voice like a loud trumpet. Now it says like a roar of many waters. This comes from Ezekiel 1.24, and I want to read that because I think that picture that it gives really shows the intensity of what we're getting at here. Ezekiel's describing the movement of the living creatures in this passage, and it says, And when they went, that is the living creatures, when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of mighty waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of a tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. What we see is this powerful, intense sound. That when an army marches, the ground shakes and rumbles. That there is such intensity that there is confusion upon those who would hear such a sound. I think of the times where I've gone to the ocean or maybe I've stood by a river that's slightly flooded and it's high and there you can hear the water rushing. And you think about torrential downpours of rain and you think about the sound of a trumpet blast and all these things coming together and that gives us only a fraction of the intensity of the voice of our Lord. And what I think is truly amazing is that those who don't know him might hear such sound and truly be confused and not know what's going on. But for for those of us who have ears to hear, though it's loud and though it's intense and though it's overwhelming, it's the voice of our king. It says, from his mouth there is a sharp two-edged sword. Calling back to Isaiah who's seeing the future coming of Jesus with a, a rod of iron and a sharp sword from his mouth so that he might judge. A two-edged sword, in other words, the word of God that cuts down every single man before it. There's not a single person who can stand against the word of God and persevere. Because the word of God cuts deep to the points of bone and marrow. And it is those who have hardened and calloused hearts, when they hear the word of God, they are laid waste. But for those of us who are born again, who are found in Christ, yes, the word of God might cut deep, but that cut also heals. And that also refreshes us and brings us newness of life. And so though it is a powerful two-edged sword, and though it cuts down those who would rebel against him, those of us that are found in Christ can find great courage in such a sword. 
His face is like the shining of the sun at full strength. God's glory, God's glory is so completely overwhelming that even the strongest of human eyes would need to look away from it. It does make me think of, back when we lived in Decorah, Iowa, there was Highway 9 that ran east and west through the town. And there was often that I have to take that road to bring both my, at the time, Mila, the youngest kid, to daycare, and then Lily to preschool. And as I would drive across that road, at a certain point of the winter in Iowa, so much more so than here, the sun comes up much later in the day. And as I'm driving up this hill, the sun is conveniently positioned right where I'm driving. And so as you're driving, you are staring dead into the sun. And it doesn't matter if you have sunglasses or the sun visor down, you just hope there's no one in front of you because no one can see. Because the sun is shining so unbelievably bright right into your eyes. This is but a fraction of the glory of our Lord. In the new heavens and new earth, it's so wonderful and powerful and glorious that there's no need for a sun because God's glory is sufficient. And so what we see is that John turns and he sees this image of Jesus, this overwhelming sight. And, and while it's amazing and it would have been sufficient in and of itself to show the authority and power of Jesus, Jesus then goes on and he speaks. So now when Jesus is speaking, we have the roaring waters. We have the trumpet blast, this intense voice. In verses 17 and 18, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. The presence of Jesus is enough to knock John off his feet as though dead. Then Jesus speaks, and this description of him being the one who is First living and then dead, but now is alive forevermore. The one who has keys, the keys of death and Hades. This reality that Jesus is not bound by death. That the grave could not contain him. And if the grave can't contain Jesus, there's nothing in all of creation that can hold him down. There's nothing that can stop him. He is more powerful, he is more glorious, more beautiful than anything else in all of creation. Because when we think about death, it's inevitable. Outside of divine intervention or something, an act of the Lord, every single one of us will taste physical death. It is a reality that we all face. Death will catch up to every single one of us, but death did not catch up to Jesus. Jesus willingly laid his life down. And though he died, and though he was in a grave for three days, at the end of those three days, he threw the stone back and he emerged victorious and triumphant over sin and death and the grave. Death has no power over him. Death does not catch him off guard. He rules over death. He rules over all of creation. And one of the beautiful things about this description of Jesus is in, found in verse 17 because we go from this glorious picture of Jesus to, to this moment that if you blink, you'll miss it. There is this radical contrast between the glory of, and the power and the authority of Jesus that he has and his grace and his mercy. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last. The fact that this sovereign, powerful, overwhelming, this beautiful, this amazing, this intense God in all of his majesty, in all of his glory would see, for all intents and purposes, a speck of dust fall on the ground before him. And he has the mercy enough to gently bend down and say, don't be afraid. We go from this intense and glorious picture of Jesus to one who has at the same time merciful and loving. Who would pick up John off the ground and say, don't be afraid. Because the reality is, church, is that if any one of us sees this side of Jesus, we are also falling on the ground as though dead. Because it is so intense, beyond anything we could ever comprehend, 
And yet Jesus gives John the strength to stand up. I think of Daniel in Daniel chapter 10 when Daniel sees the vision of the Son of Man. And Daniel, for all intents and purposes, blacks out. Jesus is so overwhelming, he passes out and he falls on the ground. And and the Lord in his grace and mercy places his hand on him and gives him strength to wake up. And then gives him strength to be on his hands and knees. And then gives him strength to stand. And though he's trembling, the Lord has strengthened him. The Lord brought him up. And so we have this, this wonderful contrast because our God is both powerful, sovereign, and glorious. He is able to create and destroy with the words of his mouth. At the blast of his nostrils, the foundations of all creation will tremble and he will judge rightly and crush the wicked. Yet at the exact same time, he is both loving and gracious. And he lifts up his children and he says, fear not. He bestows grace upon grace to those who have called upon his name, not because we've deserved it, not because we've done anything to deserve what this, this grace and love from God, but simply because he loved us first. And so this is a picture of Jesus that we need to walk with, that he is both full of power and grace, that he has authority and he is loving. He is not one or the other. If Jesus is all power, then we as sinners have no hope. We as sinners have no hope because if he's all power, he will rightly judge us and we all deserve to go to hell. But if he is all grace and all all love and he has no power and authority, then can he even save us in the first place? And even if he could save us, if he's all grace, love, and mercy, can he preserve us in himself if he has no power? He needs both. And scripture gives us both. Scripture gives this mighty picture of Jesus, yet at the same time, he leaves the 99 for the one. At the same time, he showed us grace. At the same time, we who were sinners and deserved to go to hell, he said, you are my child. Do not be caught up in the person who says, yes, well, my picture of Jesus is one that I enjoy, so I'm just going to stick with how I understand Jesus to be. Don't be so caught up in your own arrogance and your own comfort to think that you never need to refine who you understand Jesus to be. The reality is that every single one of us needs to take our understanding of God and we need to put it in the furnace of Scripture and needs to melt the impurities away, melt all the misunderstandings and any false teachings we may have accumulated over the years, anything else that needs to melt away so that all that is left is what we have in Scripture. That is a Jesus worth worshiping. And we have now this mighty, glorious, and gracious God. And yet there is a remarkable truth about who he is and what he is doing. If we look in Revelation 1, 13, it says, reading 12 and 13, it says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. If you jump to verse 20, it says, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. There is something here that we cannot miss, and that is this. Jesus is walking in the midst of the lampstands. In other words, he is walking in the midst of his church. And because there are seven, it's not accidental, this completion, this fullness, this wholeness, All of the church, throughout all of history, Christ is walking among his churches. And so if we have a God as powerful as this, if we have a God as glorious as this and as gracious as this, and we need to know and understand that that same God that has that same power and that same love, he is walking among his churches. We are not abandoned to do this on our own. He does not leave us to figure it out. He does not say, well, I purchased you with my blood, now just... Good luck. And as we continue to study through Revelation, what we're going to see in these letters to the churches is that though Christ is walking among his churches, his churches are experiencing suffering. There is a spiritual battle happening. And some of us might be surprised that there's suffering amongst the churches. If if Christ is with us, how come we're suffering? How come we're the ones that are having such a hard time? But church, our Lord suffered first. He suffered on the cross. And not only that, but he promised that those who would follow him would also experience suffering of some capacity. 
And since he suffered first, because he was whipped, because he was beaten and spit on and ultimately crucified, his kingdom was inaugurated through his suffering, and so through our suffering, our refinement, the kingdom continues to grow. Consider Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts. He was killed for his faith, and what happened? The church exploded outside of Jerusalem. The Lord took acts of evil men and he said, okay, you might do evil things, but I will use it for good and I will build my kingdom upon the backs of the martyrs. They may have died, but the kingdom will expand. And you think about modern day China where the government says, no, the church has to fit in this box that we want and the underground church says, no, that's not Christ. So the underground church grows, and the underground church in China catches fire. In fact, if you know someone who's a missionary in China, you cannot use the word missionary when speaking of them, because that puts their life in danger. Christ is not bound and suffocated out because the world is hostile to him, because he walks among his churches. And so we have to take a moment and pause and remember that last week I mentioned that our sufferings, the things that we go through, our difficulties are very different than the early church. We're not threatened with imprisonment. We're not threatened to be beaten for our faith. We're we're not under that kind of persecution, but there is still spiritual warfare occurring. And anyone who has been walking with Christ for any amount of time knows that this is true. And though our struggles may be different, there are still things that are plaguing us. And I think the most dangerous component of our spiritual warfare is not that it is drastic and dramatic and intense. It's the slow drift. It's the slow drift away from Christ. It's being comfortable. It's doing things because we've always done things. It's doing, doing what we think is okay and not God-glorifying. It's not reading your Bible one day, and then not reading your Bible two days, and then before you know it, it's been a week. It's not going to the Lord in prayer during that one time you needed to go to the Lord in prayer, and so then it becomes the next time and the next time. We experience things like social pressures and anxiety and depression, and we have issues with parenting, and we're discouraged, and there's political drama, and then there's sports, and how can we handle all these things? Well, if we just focus on that stuff and we ignore Christ, maybe it'll get better. That's what the world tells us. We're not wrestling against a political party. We're not wrestling against our depression. We're not wrestling against youth sports. We're wrestling against the principalities and the evil forces of darkness that would seek to keep us from Christ. Not telling us to be hermits and to abandon everything of the world because that's ridiculous. How can we share the gospel? The reality is that if you're going to do these things, if you're going to participate in the things the world does, be a lighthouse. Tell them of the glorious Christ. This past couple weeks have have been especially difficult in my own household because being a parent is hard. And I have not been one to experience any kind of anxiety of any kind because I've overall been a bubbly person. (laughs) But I have felt a tightness in my chest. I've had difficulty breathing and sleeping. And my wife looked at me and said, that's anxiety. And the enemy used that to pull me from Christ. To say, look at your difficulties instead. And I am so thankful for brothers in Christ that encourage me. Because that's what happened. I said, I was encouraged. And they maybe didn't even know it. They came to talk about these things. But in the conversation, I'm reminded, our God is king. That our God rules. Look at his promises. Look at the grace that he has. Stop being distracted by this. Trust in the Lord to help you through it. And I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only person who is wrestling with things, who has concerns about work or concerns about health or our finances, or there's fear of some kind. Fear of being rejected, fear of being looked at as a weird person. Maybe you're concerned about the condition of our country and you think, what, what do we have? 
we have to remember that we are not wrestling against the things of this world, but the ruling powers of darkness. And we have to remember who our king is because it is our king who commissions us. It's our king that sends us forth and says, go and walk in obedience to me, remembering my promises because I am walking with you. So we have to ask ourselves the question. As we continue to move forward and as we continue to do this study, we ask ourselves the question, as Cornerstone, where are we wrestling against the spiritual powers of darkness? As Cornerstone Church, what are the things we're doing well that the Lord would look upon us and say, well done, good and faithful servants, and what things would the Lord say, but I have this against you? And where do we need to repent and turn back to Christ? And then on a personal level then, you have to ask yourself the question, who do I understand Jesus to be? Because if he is all power, if he is, if he is all powerful, if he is all authority over heaven and earth, if he rules over his churches, if he rules over your heart, and at the same time he is full of love, grace, and mercy, do you live a life that reflects it? Do you realize that your life will be completely and totally transformed by this Jesus, and your life will reflect it. And when you don't reflect it, I think, personally, it shows that you are lacking in your understanding or lacking of your faith in Christ. Because you found something better. Or you found something easier. And I say that because that is what I wrestle with is that when there are things that cause me to go away from Christ, it's because in that moment, whether I want to admit it or not, I think that option is either better or easier. But when we look at Jesus and we see how beautiful he is and how lovely he is and how powerful he is, and we keep that before our minds, no, we're not going to walk perfectly, but we keep him before our very eyes and we have him pressed between our eyelids and as, front, as bound to our hands and we speak about him to our children and to our co-workers and we train them up in Christ and we talk about Jesus and his glorious promises when he is ever present before us. Though we may drift, he will bring us back. And if you have never heard of any of this, if you're hearing about the true Jesus for the first time with ears to hear and you've been lost in sin and you've been trying to figure out where do I fit in all of this, what does this even matter Repent of your sin and believe in Jesus. There is no one greater. I'm not promising a better life. As we'll see in these letters to the churches, they don't have necessarily a good life, but they have Jesus. And the forgiveness of sins and being in relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords to see his power and to see his authority and go, that's my God. That's the God that loves me and that's the God that defends me and that's the God that carries me forward. Let's close in prayer.